Republican battle Congressman Matt Gates. Matt Gates was one of the very few members in the entire Congress who bothered to stand up against permanent Washington on behalf of his constituents. Matt Gates right now, he's a problem for the Democratic Party, and he could cause a lot of hiccups in passing the laws. So we're going to keep running those stories to keep yeah. hurting him. If you stand for the flag and kneel in prayer, if you want to build America up and not burn her to the ground, then welcome, my fellow patriots. You are in the right place. This is the movement for you. You ever watch this guy on television? It's like a machine. Matt Gates. I'm a canceled man in some corners of the internet. Many days I'm a marked man in Congress, a wanted man by the deep state. They aren't really coming for me. They're coming for you. I'm just in the way. Steve Bannon's former producer on the War Room podcast was directly involved in the Hunter Biden laptop story and what revelations we have gotten from it regarding the Biden crime family. So you'll hear my interview with Vish Burra, who's now a member of our congressional staff, and you'll get the inside story on the Hunter Biden laptop and what some of the specific allegations of corruption mean to your life and the government that you get. But first, many in Congress in the Republican conference are confused and frustrated and concerned about the fact that Republicans helped Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi pass really the first step in their socialist agenda. They call it the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but really it's a way to punish people for driving long distances and to put a wet blanket over job creation and economic growth, the features of the Trump presidency that were the most popular. We look at these last 10 months in the Biden administration and for all of the problems they've created, this path of legislation makes things worse. If you're worried about higher gas prices, this would make them higher. If you're worried about inflation, this would make it worse. If you're worried about economic conditions that disincentivize work, this re-entrenches the policies that we have already seen fail for the last 10 months. And we had them on the ropes. A schism between Nancy Pelosi and the squad left Democrats unable to pass their legislation without Republican votes. We could have rendered Joe Biden a lame duck president right now. We could have stopped this dangerous presidency and regime dead in its tracks. But instead, 13 Republicans crossed over and gave Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi the votes they needed. Now, why did they do it? You see a clear geographic trend. A lot of people on the Acela corridor. And you know what? They traded their votes for pork barrel spending in their district. And I get you want to support your district. I love my district. I've got the highest concentration of active duty military in the country. And in the past, I've had to vote against the National Defense Authorization Act because it wasn't good for all of America. And so to see members of Congress sell out their vote, trade it for some roads and bridges and tunnels, for some train stops, it's disgraceful. We also see that many of them are retiring. And Republican leadership came to us and said, how are we supposed to manage the you know, impulses and expectations of members of Congress who aren't re running for re-election? They want to become lobbyists. And we've created a culture in the Republican Party where, hey, if you sell out on your way out, who can blame you? If those members become lobbyists, they shouldn't be welcome in the offices of Republican members of Congress. We should remember what they did. And I am shocked at the number of members of these 13 dissenters that are actually in Republican leadership. They are Republican leads on either full committees or subcommittees in the Congress, which means that our overall leadership says that on certain issues, these folks speak for us. Well, you know what? If you hope Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden pass their agenda, you don't speak for me on any issue. That should be the position of our conference. We should join together and demand that John Katko be removed as the lead on the Homeland Security Committee and any other members who are leads on subcommittees should lose those positions. I believe that in the 117th Congress, there have been five critical votes for Republicans. Impeachment, the 
witch hunt January 6th commission, removing Marjorie Taylor Greene from committees, the Bannon contempt vote, and of course, this Biden spending plan. And on every one of those critical votes, John Katko of New York, supposedly a Republican, has voted with the Democrats, and he is the Republican lead on the Homeland Security Committee. So just take a listen and see if this sounds like a Republican leader to you. Of course, Trump is a knucklehead. And of course, I don't, I mean, I, I don't like him as a person. I don't like him, uh, his, his rhetoric. I don't like his lack of discipline. In the days following January 6th, the House majority drew up an article of impeachment against President Trump. Congressman Katko crossed party lines and teamed up with the Democrats in charging Trump with inciting an insurrection. There's sometimes you got to take a vote, uh, even if you know it might cost you your job. And this is absolutely one of them. Uh, and uh, I, I'm very proud of it. Clearly, if I knew, uh, if I knew back then what I, what I saw yesterday, um, I, I clearly wouldn't have supported him. And I can't support him going forward. And I don't think the party's going to support him going forward. Well, the January 6th commission bill that was bipartisan, I wrote, along with Benny Thompson, a Democrat from Mississippi. He, we were the two heads of the Homeland Security Committee. And it was perfectly bipartisan, perfectly balanced. One side couldn't subpoena without the other. That's the way it should be. And uh, what happened was uh, people in our party politicized that and they stopped it. And it was wrong to do so. The president's role in this insurrection is undeniable, both on social media ahead of January 6th and in his speech that day. He deliberately promoted baseless theories, creating a combustible environment of misinformation and division. To allow the president of the United States to incite this attack without consequences is a direct threat to the future of this democracy. There's not a single picture, not a single clip that anyone could produce showing I've even had a picture with the guy. I don't like him. Now this work in the Congress, it certainly hasn't been popular in the state of New York. Take a listen to this radio interview from John Katko's district. Well, the comments on social media and from listeners uh, pretty critical of uh, Katko over the weekend. I want to bring in the former chairman of the Onondaga County Republican Party, Tom Dady. Tom is now a statewide leader with the New York State Conservative Party. Tom, your thoughts about Mr. Katko? Well, I mean, look, at we saw what happened last week in Virginia. We saw what happened in New Jersey. And it's like, hey, this bill seems like a really nice thing to vote for. I mean, the Republicans that voted for this need to have their head examined, Dave. Um, you know, I've heard everything from John Katko is tone deaf to John Katko is a useful idiot. John Katko is arrogant. John Katko doesn't know what he's doing on this vote. Because if you take the 228 votes that passed and back out the 13 Republicans, my math usually isn't too good, but at 215, you're still short of the 218 you need to pass legislation in Congress. And John Katko is the ultimate D.C insider who's lining himself up for a lucrative lobby job, much like Jim Walsh did when he left and much like other members of Congress do. And that's what he's doing. He doesn't care about the central New York taxpayers and the debt that we're accumulating or the fact that a $1.5 trillion spending uh, bill, only $110 billion goes to roads and bridges. The rest goes to let's help the um, electric vehicle market with batteries. Well, you know who makes 80% of the electric vehicle batteries? China. So this is nothing but a big socialist communist grab. It's a waste of taxpayer money. It's a complete boondoggle. I, I dare say John Kako didn't even read the 3,000 page bill um, because that would take probably 42 days to read in itself. He certainly didn't read it in about 32 seconds before he ran out on the floor and was the first Republican to vote for this bill. Yeah. It, it's, it's ridiculous. The Republican conference and Republican leadership should be as smart as that Republican grassroots leader in the state of New York. We should remove John Katko as the ranking member of the Homeland Security Committee. He already sold us out by going and negotiating with Benny Thompson to create a system so that our members are hunted. You can look at more coverage of that in our Under Fire episode. But now, on to the real story behind the Biden crime family and what Hunter Biden's laptop tells us about the government we're getting. I hope you enjoy. 
Hunter Biden, the black sheep of the Biden crime family. But what does it mean for all of us? Is our government for sale? Is our government engaging in corruption under the guise of a family member out selling access and selling out America? We learned that the Hunter Biden story would become central to our politics when the Hunter Biden laptop arose in really the most interesting of ways. Now, I've got a member of my congressional staff who is actually central to the recovery of the assembly of the production of the delivery of the Hunter Biden laptop. And I'm here with my colleague, Vish Burra. Now, Vish, paint the picture. Let everybody know where were you? What were you doing when you found out you were about to come into the possession of some of the most compelling evidence of the 2020 campaign cycle. Well, thank you for having me on, Matt. And uh, where I was, was in New York. It was about 11 p.m. at night, and I'm driving my former boss and mentor, Steve Bannon, um, and we're, we're driving around New York after I'd picked him up from Rudy's house, and we were doing this back and forth thing with Rudy. Now, a little after he got arrested last year, he tells me, pack up your stuff, we're going to New York. This is Steve Bannon. Yes. So Steve Bannon gets indicted under this politically motivated right. you know so-called fraud investigation where actually Bannon and Brian Kofage were out building portions of a wall in a strategic area on the U on the US Mexico border. So you're working for Bannon. Yeah. He's going back and forth. Yeah. You and, get you get the news. Yeah, and so I'm at, I'm saying Steve, what are we doing up here? You know, I'm kind of ke kept in the dark about the mission. He says pack up, we're going to New York. We don't know when we're coming back. And finally he says, "Listen, you can't tell anybody." but I think we got Hunter Biden's laptop. And I'm like, really? So I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't see it at first, but a few days after that, there, the Rudy and Bannon basically sat down and said, we need to be able to go through this thing faster and what's on it. And so that's now when- at I, this point, did you know how they had come in possession of it? Or did you just know we've got the piece of evidence? At this point, I knew we got the piece of evidence. I didn't, ha I, I didn't ask questions at that point. I just knew that whatever I'm asked to do here, I have to make, get, it, get it done. And so at that point, they needed time to go through this thing and they needed to go through it faster because there's just so much content on it. You're talking about 120,000 emails. You're talking about thousands of pictures, right? And we have to be able to go through this. Uh, this is around September, the Manhattan Project month, I called it. And so, you know, where we're cooking up this, you know, this secret weapon. And uh, that's when we realized that that's when they, I, I offered my services. I said, hey, I used to be a tech guy. You know, I can go through this thing and pull out stuff. And that's when uh, I was given access to the laptop. And then I was I also asked, how did we come? So into what was the first of category of data that you wanted to go through when you get a hold of this? Was it the email? Was it the digital files? Where, what was the first place you said, I'm, I'm opening this up and I'm diving in? Uh, I wanted to go through the emails first and the text messages, right? So a lot of people, uh, especially who have Macs, will sync their cell phones to their uh, MacBook and all their text messages come to their, to their Mac. And so this is the case with Hunter as well. And we had text me messages between him and his his father, President Joe Biden, and and uh, Hallie Biden, and you know uh, his niece, and and if all sorts of interperson. That's really what kind of you know got got my interest going is the is the interpersonal family family relationships and those interactions, and though that stuff was really re revealing to me because you know my. My little project, mini project to myself at that time is I just want to get into the mind of Hunter Biden and how he's seeing his world, you know, in the middle of this confluence of corruption and just this lifestyle of, you know, being on the road and kind of, you know, being a playboy or whatever. Like, what is that actually like behind the scenes, not what you see on TV? But you're not just getting in to Hunter Biden's mind here. You're getting in to Joe Biden's mind because you're starting to see some correspondence there, right? Absolutely. That's, you know, it's that that uh, that 4D reflection on like, you know, this is from Hunter's mind, you know, this is what's behind the scenes, but this is also Joe Biden behind the scenes responding to Hunter, right? And there was a particular email with Frank Luntz mm -hmm. that seemed to inform on kind of the Biden political dynamic. Oh yeah. We'll get it up on the screen, but walk us through 
what we're seeing here with this email, the Frank Luntz piece. The, fr the Frank Luntz thing I totally bumped into by accident. I'm just scanning through the emails. I see Frank Luntz's name, and I'm thinking, hey, isn't this like a GOP guy, a pollster? And I go, the email is basically uh, Frank Luntz upset that Hunter Biden is not returning his calls or emails, and he was lamenting, hey, why did I help out your father uh, when you guys dropped that disastrous Jeep commercial? And I went against my own client at the time, Paul Rock. Ryan <laughs> to to do that for you and you guys still won't look out for me i so, love bo by the way blah you know it was, so if you, if you have paul ryan on your hunter laptop bingo card <laughs> you can go ahead and, and mark that box now yeah but it what it shows us i think what this luntz email shows us is that hunter biden isn't some ancillary node mm -hmm. he's not out there in the ether doing his own thing right. unconnected to the politics and the ambition of his father that, right. that he is both doing the politics and doing the corruption. Was there an email, a text, a piece of evidence that really framed up kind of the seedy, swampy nature of Hunter Biden's business dealings where you would, could go back to Bannon and Rudy and say, hey, look, you know, this is something that really shows the grift. Well, I mean, there's the, the infamous big guy email, right? The 10% for the big guy. I mean, you can't, you can't cook up a more perfect situation. They're talking about uh, a deal with CEFC, the largest state-owned energy corporation in the world, uh, and uh, this, I, I believe it was a Bohai Harvest or uh, the, one of these companies that they co come together and cook up, right, to be able to funnel funds through back and forth and make it seem legit, not like you're doing direct business with a, a state-owned company. And uh, they are laying out the terms and 10% for the big guy, you know, and this is, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that, that I think was the, the international sort of big money, like, you know, international scale grift that you saw. But I think locally, what's really troubling is the, is actually the email that I, I didn't end up finding, but, uh, it exists on the laptop is the Louis Free email. I mean, you got former director of the FBI on, uh, you know, uh, doing business with you, uh, st making donations back and forth uh, between family, uh, family foundations, and and then working to get use FBI resources that currently exist in the department to do freelance work for you know Hunter Biden's clients. Like you know, that's 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 crazy. You know? you know, we talk often on the show and in the Congress about the corrupt unity of purpose that can often exist right. with corrupt businesses and corrupt government officials and melding the line, you know, kind of the, the neo-libertarian philosophy that I developed in my politics in the 2010s was let's get, you know, government just out of the decision making process. But the problem is big business has become so persuasive on government that we've now wrapped government around the apparatus of big business in a lot of ways. And that is what this energy deal really represents with sort of the foreign flavor to it right. of of big China. Right. And, you know, we have also covered the extent to which the Biden administration is influenced by China. But I mean, what what you're really laying out here in those uh, energy deals, the the 10 percent for the big guy is that there's a huge value in accessing this Chinese marketplace and being able to utilize the way that China has fused big government and big business. But our laws don't permit that. And so there are these setups and cutouts and straw men that are established. And if you can get that grift going, it, it creates a huge amount of cash and you essentially discover the blueprint for it exactly and you know it is the it, it's this sort of modern way of of doing business where you you're not out there conquering uh nations you know out and outright because then you'd have to own those nations and take those proceeds and give it to your people to justify owning them now you do this indirect you know shell company things where you're still kind of grifting you're only benefiting yourself and you're making these deals with foreign nations that still the the effects of that deal the everyday American people are subject to it, right? And see, like the the focus on the Hunter Biden laptop has been on some of the weird stuff, the bizarre pictures, the potential crimes. Um, but for most Americans, the impact is really felt 
through the corrupt acts mm -hmm. that implicate Joe Biden. I mean, you got into the brains of these folks. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about them as as people? Are they smart people? Are they crafty people? Or are these clumsy criminals and fools? Well, <laughs> let me just say this. Out of all these folks, the craftiest person is Joe Biden, right? Because he says in his texts, uh, in, in his exchanges, hey, I think my phone's being hacked. Watch what you put right down, Hunter, when you're sending stuff to me. He's, and he says it multiple times. And so he's he understands at the very least there's a lot of things you don't put in right and pick up the phone and call me or something like that, right? That's where I see the craftiness. Outside of that, but it also shows knowledge that this behavior is not something that Joe Biden wants to revisit through the lens of history, right? Exactly, right? He knows that what you put in writing can come back to haunt you sometime later, right? And so, but he understands that very sort of like uh, um, primordial game of, of keeping secrets. And so, but Hunter, I mean, this guy spills out his whole life story in these text messages and his in these emails. And what's is actually- a smart guy? He is- I would I wouldn't say super smart, but he's definitely somebody who's like in tune with how he feels and he's not afraid to express that. And he straight up says, like, I, I feel like, Dad, you've put me in this position where I'm like having to deal with you put a target on my back. Right. He explicitly says that in these emails by doing what I do for you. Right. So it impl it implies that he that so Joe, it's, it's like the uh, embryonic elements of an Oedipus complex right. developing. Exactly. You know, and so that that is what's really like scary to me. Like, can't like, Joe Biden is the kingpin in a certain way. Hunter feels like he is the one who put Joe Biden is the one who put Hunter in this position. And in the emails, uh, in in the text messages, he says, "You need to run for office, so I, so me, Hunter, I have a shot at, at redemption, right? My reputation re reputation has a shot at redemption if you run for president, you know. And so that is now part of the decision calculus when Joe Biden's deciding to run for president, as well as his son's reputation for the position Joe Biden put him in by being his bag man." You know, so it, it is certainly reflective of a of a healthy dose of narcissism. Yeah. Uh, as as you went through the the texts and the emails, um, were there other figures in politics, in media, uh, in legal circles that you were surprised to see in this nexus? Well, um, the Frank Luntz thing that was that was just fun. You know, um, the Louis Free thing is scary. Uh, one, uh, but then there is, there is this, um, uh, entity that keeps popping up that I definitely think needs way more looking into. It's this entity called Eudora and, um, there's this gambling thing around it called Huega Ocho Gaming that might implicate a close associate of Senator Dick Durbin, as well as Harry Reid's son, Key Reid. And, and because see, the way I see it is... Uh, the China grift and and all these foreign po foreign policy grifts. These are all just trying to create laundry machines abroad to be able to send taxpayer money for it to find it way, find its way back into your personal pockets. And I believe that the Bidens engaged in this thing with other elites in our system. You know, the elected elites to set up this like a gaming uh, uh, grift or laundry machine in South America. I believe it's called Juega Ocho Gaming. And then they use this Eudora entity as well to to basically get that money from Ocho Rio into Eudora and then split it out to the, the, the folks. Well, that you said something very important and it informs on precisely the legislative work that we see the Congress embarking on now, that the way the elites try to use their power is to leverage the largesse of the US dollar abroad and frankly, even at home, and then to see that wealth, that value transition right back to their businesses, to their pocketbooks, and to hope that they're able to sort of keep the plates spinning long enough for the surf class, the plebes, the regular folks to just allow it to happen. Yeah, it's like the, you know, three the three card Monty kind of game that you'd see pop up that on a street corner of New York, except they're doing it with your tax money, <laughs> you know, and the only loser at the end of the day is you, <laughs> you know. Was there a piece of evidence on the laptop that either Rudy Giuliani or Steve Bannon found particularly compelling where they said, hey, this is the smoking gun. This is what we have to ripen. Well, there was a piece of evidence on there that they felt so compelled um, uh, that it was a criminal 
uh, it was cr- it was criminal to possess it that Rudy um, hand delivered the uh, this piece of evidence along with a few other pieces of evidence uh, to the uh, Delaware Attorney General and Steve and I followed Rudy in as he's delivering it just to make sure he gets there you know that's that's the kind of you know level we're on as we're trying to get this thing into the right hands uh, as we're trying to do the right thing basically expose this wrongdoing and corruption uh, this piece of evidence it, it, it was de- it's on the salacious side of things but uh, we delivered that to the Delaware Attorney General and I don't think anybody's ever heard Uh, of any news popping out of that since. You had to know at some point that this was going to become the biggest political story in America. Uh, What decisions were made or what was the perspective on sort of the New York Post as an initial outlet? Were there other outlets that were skeptical at first? How did how did how did you go from the investigative reporting that you were doing, Steve Bannon was doing as a part of your work for War Room uh, to actually getting this into the political bloodstream of the country yeah so um you know the the daily mail uh was one of the first uh outlets to uh come out and verify and this is now this is after the election of course but they had a forensic uh sort of like uh auditor the technical auditor go through uh, the hard drive and and they published that they verified it and that it's real right or at the very least it hasn't been manipulated by any outside hands this is what it said says it is and i i found that to be a mea culpa because it was the daily mail originally that we went to before the new york post to try and get this this story out the largest website in the world right it, exactly it's got the it drives the mo- the highest traffic so the daily mail was our initial um attempt to, to get this story out we showed, you know, we made the pitch with a few a few things. And as I'm watching the journalist that we showed it to, his, his face turned white, you know. Um, but what he ended up not publishing it. And, you know, this the story at that at that time I got from Steve is that he may have felt that he didn't want to be the guy to take out Joe Biden if so Joe Biden pressure. lied. There was pressure here. And, you know, I want to I want to get into that for a moment because there's a mundanity to the whole thing. It's not, you know, somebody's getting a phone call from Biden and it's like, you can't publish this story or, so, you know, one of his goons. Right? No, it's a very human thing. It's like, I got to go to work tomorrow, publish this story. And all my friends are probably hate Trump, love Biden. And if I got to go in there and I publish this story and Joe Biden loses my entire industry might hate me, you know? And so because they're all haters of Trump or a good chunk of them are. And so that, you know, th- I think that was part of the calculus. And another thing I want to I want to state is, um, you know, there's a ton of salacious stuff on there. We approached TMZ with that early on. And you've seen the kind of stuff TMZ publishes, but they said no to this. So, so uh, you, you couldn't meet the editorial and journalistic <laughs> standards of TMZ. Yeah. That must have been disappointing. I mean, here you guys had you guys had captured this evidence. Yeah. You had done the reviews. No. You had found information no. that you thought really illuminated the inner workings of this crime family right. at in serious ways right. and also in sort of salacious uh, ways as well. Yeah. And here you go to two entities and it sounds like they weren't having it. No, they they weren't having at least not at that time. You know, right. they it, it, the the what but the but the right. What foreshadowing? Because what you were about to face in terms of headwinds from big media and big tech has literally never been seen before in American democracy. I, I couldn't have written a script, you know, in Hollywood that would have passed if I told you, you know, like this is what we're gonna do, and this is going to be the overt brazen reaction from big tech media i mean it was like it was all it, it was practically all coordinated I, i'm not going to say that everyone was on the phone with each other saying we're going to do this I think what you're saying yeah. is that there is an ethic yeah. around investigative reporting that is negative for democrats right. that isn't explicit but that is very potent right you know and that ethic is you know if it's bad about Republicans, get it out, source it later, sort it out later, yeah. you know, get clicks that something's bad about this a Republican. That's right. the, the way they're kind of thinking about but it. But when it's about a Democrat, people start to think, okay, well, you know, do I want to have as a part of my forever journalistic yeah. identity 
taking out a Democrat, right. exposing a Democrat, potentially even causing a Democrat presidential candidate to lose. Right. And and that's the unwritten rule. Right. But the unwritten rule, it sounds like, is the strongest because right. despite the authenticity of this evidence, the relevance right. of this evidence, uh, you face strong headwinds. You finally get it out with the New York Post. Right. Uh, tell me about that moment when you finally know this thing you've been working on, this political yeah. Manhattan project, yeah. is finally going to yeah. erupt in some way. So I wake up. I, I, I we finally got the conference, and we pushed really, really hard to get the get it through the New York Post. Finally, we got an approval to push it, and I, I will say that it the decision did go all the way up to Murdoch on that one. Um, but we finally got it through, uh, and what. That morning, I was running. I ran out of the the hotel room that we were staying at. We were hurt, working out of a hotel for months at that point, because I want a hard copy of the of the New York Post story so that I could like frame it, you know. And uh, I wanted to get a few copies. And uh, unfortunately, these days, you know, even the local delis in New York don't even have a, a hard copy of the New York Post anymore. Kind of sad, but. Uh, I once and then we had to go produce the war room at that time, too. So I'm looking for any any buzz, uh, you know, in the in the morning once the story dropped that morning. Uh, no, no buzz in the news. Right. So we're really the war rooms kind of like the, the, the New York Post publishes publishes it. And the war room is kind of the first on it to 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 broadcast it in a in a video format. And so what we're thinking is oh well this didn't kind of have the effect that we were thinking but once it was all shared made it to the ether on the internet right on twitter on facebook and the story sh starts getting shared around that was when it blew up because people started texting me saying hey this i, I can't even like send this to you via facebook messenger or dm this to you by twitter this is weird and then all then multiple reports started popping up and that's when people realize like wait a minute like the te the tech companies are blocking the sharing of this story and then it eventually comes out that they locked the new york post out of their own ac account on and this is not you know this is not like infowars or anything like this. this is the new york post and they locked them out of their twitter account for publishing this story i mean you i i, I couldn't i would have never believed that the big tech companies would overtly try to challenge uh, the ability of a publisher to, to you know, a, a media company, a brother in arms, I would even say, <laughs> you know what I mean, in, in sort of the, the metaverse of things uh, to distribute information to people that they would shut one out because there's a story here that they don't like, you know? It, it really is the strongest evidence I have ever seen that big tech wants to be the arbiter of truth itself right. you know that that while in the law while when they come and testify before congress they say we just want to be a platform we just want to be a place where people come and share information and interact with one another that that's not true that when the chips are down when you're in a high impact moment like the days and weeks before an election and when you have a highly relevant piece of information they want to be the ones yeah to make the judgments, yeah. not the American people. Absolutely. Well, what, what I what the way I see it is that these tech companies essentially want to uh, establish a monopsonic relationship between the rest of the world and reality itself, where they are the ultimate middleman and everything has to go through them. In the words of Dave Chappelle, Twitter is not a real place, <laughs> um, yeah, but exactly. but it does really impact politics, right? right? And that's why it must have been very frustrating for you personally and for your colleagues, Steve Bannon and Rudy Giuliani, yeah. to have done all this work, yeah. to have gotten no less than the New York Post right. to verify and publish it, yeah. and then still the most powerful forces yeah. in media and technology trying to limit the distribution of your work. I mean, that, that it couldn't have been all glee at that point for you. I mean, there, there, there's a moment of upsetness there, but you know, as at that time, I'm still in the, the mindset of a renegade media professional. So, you know, our rule is, you know, you get censored, that's a badge of honor, right? You're, and if you really think about it, the story didn't really pop until the censorship of it 
was what kind of uh, happened. That's when the mentions of the story and all that really shot through the roof. There's Twitter data and there's there's data behind this. But basically, that once the story was censored, that's when its exposure and distribution really went through the roof. Because the interest now the the distribution was sort of reversed. Right, people are going to going out and looking for it and plucking it from any place that they could find. I don't think this is over. You know, the the evidence that we've discussed here that you have brought to the world uh, really does show a sophisticated business system uh, that is probably used by a lot of American elites to drain the U.S. experience uh, and to use it for their benefit. Uh, recently, uh, my colleague Ken Buck in the Judiciary Committee exposed the modern incarnations of the Hunter Biden grift through the art sales Take a listen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Attorney General, I'd like to direct your attention to the easel behind me. Uh, the first painting is a Claude Monet. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't read any of the words. Uh, you don't need to. Okay. You just need to look at this great painting right here. It's a very beautiful painting. It is beautiful, and uh, it is listed at Christie's for $700,000. Uh, now, Claude Monet was uh, the founder of the Impressionist uh, movement, something I didn't know until I researched it. Um, the second painting is a Degas. It, uh, another world-renowned artist, and this painting sold for $500,000. The third painting, you may recognize this name, is a Hunter Biden. I, I, Biden don't, I don't recognize the painting. The Hunter Biden painting sold for $500,000 also. Now, you may think that such an exclusive, um, that, that when Hunter Biden is in such exclusive company, that he would have a background, you know, artistic training, for example. Um, but you would be wrong if you thought that. And you might think that he had some sort of apprenticeship with a world-renowned artist, but you would be wrong again if you thought that. Or perhaps that he has been selling his works for years, and again, unfortunately, you would be wrong. It turns out that in 2019, Hunter Biden couldn't find a gallery to list his art. And what happened in 2020 that changed all that? His dad became president of the United States. Now, a single piece of art from Hunter Biden sells for more than the average American home. This art arrangement is so suspicious that the Obama administration ethics czar, Walter Schaub, tweeted on July 10th of this year, Hunter Biden should cancel this art sale because he knows the prices are based on his dad's job. Shame on POTUS if he doesn't ask Hunter to stop. By the way, Mr. Attorney General, this is the same Hunter Biden who's being investigated by your department and the IRS for tax fraud. Selling fakes or selling or having a fake skill set is nothing new to Hunter Biden. When his dad was vice president, Hunter Biden received $50,000 a month from a Ukrainian oligarch to sit on a board of an energy company. What was Hunter Biden's background in energy? Nada, nothing, zilch. Soon after he received his dad, um, soon after he and his dad got off Air Force Two in China, Hunter Biden became a private equity guru and assisted with a Chinese private equity firm linked to the Chinese Central Bank. You might ask what his background was with Pacific Rim Investments or the Chinese Central Bank. Nothing. With his dubious track record inquiring minds might question why any art gallery would want to sell Hunter Biden's art. Well, this particular art gallery had its COVID relief loan more than doubled by the Biden administration. In a survey of more than 100 art galleries in New York's 10th Congressional District, this particular art gallery received by far the largest SBA disaster loan. And as an aside, Mr. Attorney General, the member who represents the 10th Congressional District is none other than Chairman Nadler. Mr. Attorney General, who buys Hunter Biden's art? Who benefits? What benefits do they receive from the Biden administration? The American people want to know. I have sent a letter to the Department of Justice before your tenure asking them to appoint a special counsel to investigate Hunter Biden. I have uh, today sent a letter to you, and I am asking you uh, now, will you appoint a special counsel to investigate Hunter Biden? I'm not, uh, for the same reason that I'm not um, able to respond to questions about investigations of the former president, or of anyone else, I'm not unable, able to discuss uh, any in 
investigations pending or otherwise with respect to any uh, citizen of the United States. So, Vish, what's next? I mean, Ken Buck just described uh, a circumstance where Hunter Biden is out there literally selling his art right alongside the masters and getting master level uh, compensation for it. Uh, have we heard the last of Hunter Biden? Absolutely not. So what I will say is that um, I am probably still the only person uh, on this side of America that could competently make a copy of this thing. And I've distributed over 40 copies to multiple outlets that have uh, peaked. Their interest has peaked after, you know, Joe Biden has won. He's firmly in place. And now people are looking for a point, uh, ways to make their own bones now, now that, you know, they don't have to worry about being the pariah. And so the, the interest level has gone up in the Hunter Biden laptop since. And um, I believe you will start seeing more mainstream outlets uh, verifying this thing and coming out and saying, that they're that you know this thing is real and these are things that have to be addressed and i and would do you think the ocho rios south american gambling story yeah. is still the untold story right. that some investigative the, reporters need to get on yeah and and it could tie back to even current members of the legislative branch of yes. government eudora and juega ocho gaming that's the those are the two entities that, that's where i think that that the real meat of like the like if you really want to kind of get the the rat's nest at once that I think those are the places you would have to look um, but uh, I also believe that whatever it is there's a ton of stuff on there um, I think that we should also be very careful because you know I, as being from New York I kind of see like what's what what is happening with biden could also could could sort of harken back to what happened with cuomo where at the right time he kind of needed to get rid of the guy and that these stories would now be deployed to put get somebody else in place ah, so they could be tools waiting in the wings if right. it's determined that joe biden is too much of a drag on the political left that they want to sort of freshen up the movement with kamala harris and whatever assembly of child actors she's hanging out with that day that you think that actually the we could be learning more about the hunter laptop the corruption that's on there going forward if the left and the media choose to politically take out the guy that they sort of just used as a uh, as a masthead mm -hmm. for the anti-Trump movement. Correct. And I, I the, and, you know, uh, I said this when when Andrew Cuomo was uh, was about to be it looked out very obvious he was about to be removed and C Kathy Hockey would take his place. I said this then I would I would say it again if if that seems to be the obvious case with Joe Biden. It only goes left from here. <laughs> you know well, a good place to end it my colleague vish Burra, thanks for what you've done as an investigative reporter thanks for what you do now for the congress and my expectation is that we have not heard the last of hunter biden we've not seen the last of the contents of this laptop thanks, thanks for, fish thanks, thanks for having me thanks for listening to firebrand make sure you're subscribed on all of your listening platforms that you have your notifications turned on and leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing and maybe some suggest some topics that you'd like us to cover in an upcoming episode.